exclusive interview with Vice President uh, Dr. Bharat Jagdio. Um, the reason we have these kind of interviews is to bring clarity. A lot of questions are, um, I receive a lot of messages with questions and people who want clarity, Guyanese citizen, citizens looking for clarity on and transparency on what the government is doing and what they're hearing. So very, very important is the need for clarity in um, Guyana and as it relates to how the government is using uh, the resources allocated or the resources that they have access to for the people of this country. Dr. Jagdio, good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity. Um, I know there we have not had this opportunity for quite some time as a result of um, works that the government is doing. But again, this is much needed because there is um, much confusion created in our society as a result of misinformation, deliberately orchestrated uh, propaganda to mislead, confuse, create a doom and gloom atmosphere. Um, for those who, who are on the ground, they are aware that it's confusing for them, but clarity is needed. For those in the diaspora, they're totally unaware of what's going on in Guyana. Um, although the information is out there, the doom and gloom effect hits first, persons first. They're affected directly by that before um, or ahead of nice, interesting, developing stories. Mm -hmm. um, just like crime, people would be more interested in crime than a love story. Mm -hmm. um, the music that people listen to, they're more drawn to violent music than um, nicer melodies. So that is the doom and gloom is having um, information being peddled out there by certain sections of society and some politicians. It's having a very negative effect in Guyanese. So thank you for this opportunity to bring clarity on this. Um, heading straight into a lot of issues, uh, one of the issues that are affecting Guyanese, I've received many calls from the members of um, supporters of the opposition um, because I, I keep an open channel everybody has my number they message me and thousands of message as it relates to two consecutive administrations given Epadji an organization um, which so happens to be a private company not only an organization but a private company has there been some oversight by your administration in giving this organization $300 million over the process of three years. And there is, in fact, as you said, no accountability for the money spent so far? Yeah, before, um, well, thank you very much for having me on the program. Before I address that issue, um, I disagree with the characterization that somehow in the masses of the country there is a feeling of gloom and doom because of naysayers and misinformation. I think our people are smart enough, they know the players enough because they, each of them have a track record to recognize the nonsense that is being peddled. And many people just ignore the sometimes downright stupidity of, that is being peddled by some in the opposition and some other some of the other naysayers. People have an uncanny sense of what is fair, what is right, and they know the play as well. So in the mind of an ordinary person in this country, regardless of how you vote it, the APNU has demonstrated uh, incapacity to manage anything. They've had 28 years in government, and we ended up at the end of the period 
poorer than when we started, one of the poorest countries in the world, and then they had five years again, and we started the decline again. So their capacity to manage the economy is recognized, or their incapacity to manage the economy is recognized. So do you think that anybody takes Norton seriously when he says, we're going to remove all these taxes if we get into government? We saw that promise in 2015. In a huge manifesto, people were paying too much taxes, but under the PPP, we'll change this. And then we had an increase in 200 taxes and fees. That's the track record. P they believe people have forgotten this. Nobody has forgotten this. Then imagine a Norton. Norton has never really managed anything seriously. Or their chief economist, Eurita Fernand, sometimes when she speaks, I, I wonder if the University of Ghana would consider taking back degrees that they confer on some people because of the nonsense that she says. That, that, that's not, no economic sense. Just think about this, the bunch of MPs that we have there. Will you entrust them to manage any economy? A donkey cart economy, much less an oil and gas economy in the future? Nobody will do that. They know they'll make a mess of it. And so you, you are saying people are gloom and doom. These ordinary people are very sensible. They're smart. They know this. And this, when they talk about corruption, this was a kleptocracy that we just emerged from. That for three years, the first three years in, since 2000 did not submit statements to the Integrity Commission. They took place on the Granger and the PNC government. From 2000 to 2015, every year, the statements to the Integrity Commission were submitted. Three years missing under the PNC. You recall the minister, the land policy. Up to now, we can't figure how much land they sold, to whom we're trying to recover this. Jordan, after the elections, put out a gazette, signed an order to transfer to over 100 persons plots of land in Linden, but the cronies, not ordinary people who are struggling to get a piece of land, they now, those people are now going to get 1,000 houses being built because the president promised that in London and they just got another 400 lots at Amelia's Ward. But you check, in the five years, the 100 odd persons who got plots of land there were all politically connected. It's the Figueres and Lowenfield and the others. So you think they would fool anybody on the kleptocracy side Continuing with that, we had ministers who are collected stuff. We now demonstrated there before the courts on these matters. A, a whole range of, of issues I can list today that I chose not I choose not to because the list is so long. And they're trying to hide from hide from this and change the narrative or oh, the PVP is corrupt. So nobody has short memory here. And people, they now make cost of living issue a big issue. Oh, cost of living has increased. Who more than the government has acknowledged this? Who more than the government has acknowledged this? We said, every time you speak, you, say it, you hear the government say, this is a big concern of ours. And there are reasons. There are reasons for this happening. But who do you think has the capability? Who would you prefer being in government to address cost of living issues? An incompetent APNU or the PPP that has demonstrated that it will take measures to alleviate people's concerns? 
by, by changing the way we calculate um, the taxes on the CIF value by direct help to the hinterland and riverine areas, by removing the fat on water and electricity, by doing a number, helping the, the, for inputs, the farmers with their fertilizers, by putting in place already 11,000 part-time jobs to increase disposable income. Who do you think? You, you think the APNU had the creativity or the capability to address any increase in cost of living? Who would you want in government when you, if you have a pandemic? APNU demonstrated five months, nothing. After the five months, oh, they locked down the country and we were doing maybe 30, 40 tests per day. We now have a capability of doing 5,000 tests per day. When we try to get the vaccines, they try to undermine us getting vaccines, try to undermine people taking the vaccines. So people know that, who, and, and therefore, who, who would you want to deal with the oil and gas companies? The PP has demonstrated in a short period that it will take on those companies and protect national interests. We, they could have passed the local content legislation. They didn't. We passed it. We passed it so that Guyanese business and individuals can get more and we can get more, extract more from these companies. Who is moving forward with the agreement to, get, to monetize the gas and to get cheaper power and free, free gas from the free gas from the companies? It's a PVP. So I don't su subscribe to this gloom and doom. I believe people are very excited about our future. We have challenges. People are excited about that future. And people treat them as nuisance, as a nuisance. Norsen is a nuisance. He has no presence, no capability. He has no depth when he speaks about important matters. He, he sticks with only a few of the political issues and the song bites. You can't run country with song bites. And that's all they have there. So, Coming back to the other question that you mentioned, they raised with me. So we had expressed some concerns when in opposition about the funding going to this group. So first of all, it is a private limited liability company. And the directors are listed as the beneficial owners of the company. So, so recently, after my statement at the convention center, saying, pointing out that the financial statements are not available, the late, only two years of financial statements were submitted up to 2020. And I pointed out that in the, the 100 million in the 2020 financial statement, only 343,000 went as grant to ordinary people. Everything else went to salaries, rentals, a whole range of other things. So, Vincent Alexander said he wanted to sue me. Well, today you check the newspapers and my lawyers have responded to his lawyers to say he could proceed with a lawsuit because we intend to vigorously challenge this. But I think that lawsuit or the, the threatened lawsuit is to muzzle me. And if he knows anything, I would never allow Vincent Alexander or any person of his ilk to muzzle me. I have a fiduciary duty as general secretary of one of the, the, the largest party in the country and as, as vice president and a member of this cabinet to question the use of taxpayers' money. 
and they have had five, nearly $500 million of taxpayers' money and have not until now accounted for its use because financial statements are not presented as yet. But what I know, based on all the other organizations that have been calling me, that ordinary Afro-Guyanese have not benefited from this money, and the money was given by government to improve the lot, not of an elite group, or to spend on themselves, but to, to get to improve the lives of ordinary Afro-Guyanese in the country. And they fail miserably, and they have to account for the money. They have to tell their country and those organizations that they claim to represent how much money went to, in salaries and who received the salaries. Because imagine if you look at 40 something million dollars a year in one year for salaries and five years, that's over $200 million in salaries. In the five years that we were in opposition, I had a constitutional office. I did not take the salary as leader of the opposition. I did not take the salary. So my only income was the presidential pension. But my office, the constitutional office, got about $200 million, totally, for the office of the leader of the opposition. $50 million a year? Right, just, just on about just 40, on. $50 million a year, in five years. So they got $500 million. And we had to account for it. They got $500 million. So we would like to see how, what, how they chose the people that they rented the buildings from and who got the contract that, for the building that they rented. And you may be shocked to find out who the person is. So we want to find out all of that about all these conferences and the activities that they arrange, like the market day and how much that costs. So they have to, they can't run away from this. They have to account for this. But now when called upon to account for it, Vincent Alexander and the others believe they can muzzle me by a threatened lawsuit. When I said about people who are parasitic, you know, a lot of people in this country claim to represent particular interests. I've seen some of the very people who are part of this organization, they are advocating that, in fact, Vincent Alexander and another director were going to speak at a conference about the emerging apartheid state in Guyana. Imagine they were part of an organization that was getting a hundred million dollars a year from the government. And then we're going to speak about the emerging apartheid state in Guyana. So a lot of people, I've seen them go to Buxton and everywhere else and beat their chest about how they represent Afro-Guyanese and Afro-Guyanese interests. And I said that they are parasitic. They are using the cause to justify their own pecuniary interests. Many people. Because there were any funds that will go to improvement of afro Guyanese, they corner those funds and utilize them for other purposes. So you asked about the PPP continuing the, the money, the 300 million. Frankly speaking, we should have um, sorted this out before, asked for that accountability. And we should have stopped it if it was not going to ordinary people. And maybe give the same funding to the other organizations. 
the 50 other organizations in the country. Maybe we should have done that in retrospect. But then you would have heard how the PPP was defunding this organization. So in retrospect, it's good that it happened to that the people of this country, including the other afro guyanese organizations, can see the true nature of many of the people representing them. Dr. Jagdeo, before we move on, I would like to um, just go in a little deeper. Your, this organization, Apatagy, claims to represent some 60 other organizations, okay. most of which um, represent afro guyanese interests. Are there any other companies, Indian companies, Amerindian companies, or Portuguese affiliated companies that receive this magnitude of government funding? No, are, is there no, any one? No, 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 they're not. And their funding related to the decade that the UN had in, instituted. So it was specific to that decade and we do not begrudge the funding. We, uh, and, and organizations getting the funding. We do not begrudge this. So it's, but it should be used for the development of ordinary people. We don't begrudge it. We just are concerned about how it was utilized. You have made a point of two of the executives of this company um, that is funded by government going to preach an apartheid state on yeah. the arising of an apartheid state. Um, in a press conference, one of the executives made reference to the fact that some of the funding went to them going in the community in Region 5 after the deaths of the Henry boys and giving advice and counseling to the Henry family and also the community now, immediately after the Henry boy's death, this, the executive made claims that they went into the community and they gave counseling. This is while, immediately after the, while people would have been burning streets from those same communities and there was major disruption to this country. Does the PPP feel that they have erred in financing such organizations that has brought much pain and anguish to the people of this country. And how, do this how does the PPP plan to treat, the government plan to treat these kinds of things in the future? Well, the funding was never dedicated to that sort of issue. In fact, instead, as demonstrated by the, the topic that they were discussing, they were using the funding to create political problems and divisions in this country. Political problems and division among people of different races. And so it goes back to show now that, that the statement by the Rastafarians might be accurate that they were excluded, they had to walk away because APNU gave the funding to this organization not to help afro guyanese but to campaign for APNU. And the key message of APNU is racism, racial division. So instead of promoting racial harmony, empowerment of afro guyanese upliftment of afro guyanese it seems as though the funding was used to undermine national harmony and to create a better a, a, a breeding ground for the vile jaundice propaganda um, the, not the breeding ground but the incubation ground for the vile jaundice propaganda of the the Elks of Norton. 
Norton and the PNC. So that was the purpose. Clearly, that was not the government's purpose, the PPP government's purpose in extending the funding. But as I said before, the ministry erred. The ministry should have looked at how the funds were being used when they continue to advocate, to, to make it available every year since we've been in office. They should have done that, not now, but every year. I know the minister uh, within the Ministry of Culture, Youth and Sports, uh, Charles Robinson Jr., has requested yes. um, documentation as to how this money was spent. What is the way forward for, in light of the revelations, what is the way forward for well, the Well, for, first, we, we will ensure that once we get this information, I'm sure the country and everyone, including the 60 organizations, the 50, 60 organizations that they claim they represent, would want to know how much they spent on salaries and who received the salaries. Who received the salaries? The rentals, the conferences, etc. These, these were things done all in their name. So then we will see and those organizations will get a chance to judge. So we had await, we had await the submission of all of this information. Dr. Jaglio, the term apartheid state, um, the apartheid and its, its history and, and the pillars of what make up apartheid, there is no such existing evidence that there's any likenesses of an apartheid state here. How does the government plan to address these deliberate attempts to create unrest in our country? Is there the a strategy is, for that? It's the, that is why I'm saying that people are wise to this. And I always have great faith in the ability of the people of this country. People were provoked in the five months to come on the streets and, and swear in Granger. And all you had was a bunch of fossils going around by the GCOM there, but nobody paid much heed to the, them. All people would have liked, I'm sure, a lot of APNU supporters that they would have actually won the elections, that, but they didn't fall prey to the propaganda and come on the streets and and carry forward the the lie that APNU was pushing. So our country has matured. This is not the early days when the PPP just took office, when we had very little money, when the country was bankrupt. And we had to struggle to get money to pay wages and salaries and debt alone. When we had the, the infrastructure was totally destroyed, we didn't have power, no roads to drive on, no drugs in the hospital. Those were the early days. Didn't have a middle class in this country because for 20 years prior to that, there was no housing program. There was no ministry of housing. Land was not given out to people. So there was no middle class. It was a tiny group of people, extremely rich, and everybody poor. Today, because of the efforts of the PPP, and we stuck at it through the hard times, through provocation, through assault by APNU on the streets and everything else, through criminals and, and a GCOM, etc trying to displace the PVP. We stuck at it. We, we, we pursued the right policies. Today, we have a growing middle class. More people in this country now own a house. They own a car. In fact, in fact since the PP has been in office, we've had five, 600,000 vehicles that have been imported. And, and um, so they have a house, they have jobs, and they're growing in the middle class. 
That has changed in this country. So people sometimes don't remember that historical perspective. A country with a growing middle class becomes more stable. Sometimes people, we don't get the credit for rebuilding a private sector, a local private sector that was absent when we got into office because 80% of the economy was controlled by the state. We don't get credit for that, but today we have a vibrant local private sector because of our policies. Secondly, the housing and the middle class and ownership of vehicles and all of that. So the society has changed today. And therefore, people are not going to be easily pushed into extreme action. People have assets to protect now. People of every race have assets to protect. They have their own houses, they have their, their vehicle, etc. Not when people don't have any assets, they just on the street, they, can't, they don't have assets to protect. But if people want, and more and more of our people are looking for a scholarship, they're looking to get a house lot, they're looking to get a, get a car, and I'm going to be bothered with the foolishness of Norton and the others. So occasionally they will mislead a few people into, into protests and all of that by using extremism. And that happens in any part of the world. And we have a capability of dealing with that. Because if they, with the, the law must come down hard on the extremists too. They, when the extremist statements are made that are divisive and contrary to the laws of the country, then people must face the consequences. And that's how you prevent this from happening. And then, of course, a constant, a constant um, outreach and response to all of these things. I wish I did not have to go at great length every time to talk about this. But if we don't, then they will keep misleading the people. And that's why I had to point out at the same press conference that they say, oh, the PPP doesn't want to empower afro -Ganese. Um I heard even this guy, what's his name? Uh, Heinz, David Heinz said, oh, afro Guyanese need empowerment through better education. And I pointed out that in the first year of the PPP government, because of the gold scholarship, more afro Guyanese got scholarships in the first year than in the five years and that. And the same thing in term, in land allocation. The first two years, more got land allocated than the five years of APNO. That's when you measure things in a real sense. But also others are, have an equal right. This country needs to understand that. That the Amerindians have an equal right to the access resources. Sometimes when you listen to Afro, to, to, to Norton and the others, they ignore that there is a reality in this country. There is a Guyana made up of people of different races. And you have poor people in, in almost every group and people who deserve help. So when they were in office, they wouldn't help anyone, they helped themselves. But when they're out of office, the others must not get any time, they begrudge. Oh, you gave um, $250,000 to the sugar workers, but would never say that every year for the past 25 years, We've subsidized every household in Linden to the tune of about $200,000 per annum in electricity costs. They would never say that. So this is the sort of, of thing that we need to go fight against. Every group, the farmers need help, the fishermen need help. They, oh, they do the ethnic count all the time. Never mind these farmers, if they get help, they can produce more and bring the cost of living for all of Ghana down. And that they face a real problem with the increase in fertilizer prices. 
So this is how they behave. So we have no apology to make for helping Amerindians. Amerindians need a lot of help and hinterland people. That's why we're giving the grant and improving health care and education and access. Or the indo guyanese communities or other communities or mixed people. We don't have any apology for helping them in the sugar belt or the farmers. If they need the help, they will get it because we're that kind of government. So if they believe that this is reverse psychology, they force us to feel guilty about giving farmers or the sugar workers some resources or somebody else or a Portman, a village of Portman built two roads there in the village that we'll we'll draw back and we'll not do it. They are they're smoking weed. Dr. Jagdio, what do you think would be the reason for the misguided information that is being placed by the opposition out in the public as it relates to local government elections. Is the PPP ready? And what do you see as the opposition's game plan? How does the PPP uh, deal with that? Yeah, well, Norton put his foot in his mouth. He said he's not going to elections until there is a new voters list. Well, we will have local government elections soon, and it has to be on the current voters list. So let's see if he is going to withdraw the statement and contest the elections. Do you think GCOM is doing enough to bring awareness to the public? They've, they've GCOM in the past. No, exactly. Now, GCOM should be defending this. When Norton speaks about, and I saw they did it recently, they said, we are bound to follow the laws of the country and the constitution of Guyana. And I pointed out that Norton and the others have been arguing for us to do something that which is unconstitutional, which is the removal of people's name from the voters list based on residency. When the constitution specifically eliminated that in the early 2000s, there was residency in the constitution and that with the consent of all the parties was removed. So that is Norton and the others are trying to get us under the guise that the list is bloated to remove people's names from the voters list. We, can, we will never do that. Um, that's one. Two, they, they said they want the biometrics now, which was a back doorway of removing people from the voters list, which will suffer the same fate as the infamous voters ID you know, when that was challenged in court and ruled unconstitutional and the people, the, the PPP lost two years of its term. Justice Claudette Singh ruled against the use of ID card for voting that APNU and the PPP had agreed to the PNC and PPP and, uh, and then they challenged it after the elections, after they lost the elections in 97. So we're not going to go down that route again. Now, at the last press conference, I said that Vincent Alexander had claimed that they had multiple instances of voters' impersonation, and they had evidence of this supplied by state agencies. So we recently wrote GCOM to ask for the information about the multiple instances of voters' impersonation and what evidence they had. Vincent Alexander and the others are opposed to us getting that information. Not just PPP, but make, put it in the public domain. If that doesn't tell you uh, a story, then nothing will. So these guys are 
last night I listened to President Biden and he said that there could be only two outcomes for some people in, in elections. One, they win or alternately the election was stolen. Only two outcomes for them. You listen to what Biden said last night. That was, I almost thought he was speaking about PNC. Somebody had slipped that in his speech that he was speaking about the PNC and Ghan. So once they lose the elections, it has to be somebody stole it. Not that their useless and their inept policies and track record has caused people not to want to vote for them. Dr. Chadio, being one of the most um, more seasoned politicians, um, Minister of Finance, President for 12 years, one of the longest serving, or the longest serving president, um, just a little bit of insight. Would you suggest that the PNC is playing at this game because there's a likelihood the PPP could decimate them at the local government elections and they're trying to create some bit of confusion before that? Not necessarily, but um, because I don't think the prize is local government elections. It's national elections. So that is what they're... But this, they have no other narrative. They have no other narrative to, to make. And local government elections, um, you generally don't get the kind of turnout, the high turnout and stuff like that. So we are now looking... We're looking to win as a political party, but we're looking to see that we get a functional local government system. I think they're setting up even now an excuse for their impending defeat in 2025, December 2025. That's, that's all they're doing. And so they have to be the victim. The PNC campaigning strategy is we're the victim. We go and tell the international community how we are treated at elections, we're discriminated against, afro ghanis are discriminated against, the victim psychology. That's all they were. They, they can say, oh, we have a, a master plan that will change the country, because they never would have one. Never had one. Never, they can say, Look at our track record, how we removed the debt burden from the country. They can only say we increased the debt burden on the country. We can say we remove it. We can say we move the per capita GDP from 300 US dollars to $9,000. Now, be, what would they say? They can say they took it down to $300. From, from one of the highest in the region in the 60s. What, what do you say except, oh, we're the victims. Everybody is treating us badly. Dr. Jagio, a lot is being done, not said, I must say. Contracts are being awarded. There's going to be a new Demerara Harbor Bridge. Um, roads, everywhere is blocked up as we go along the roads because of the fact there are new roads, there are new bridges being built. There's a massive um, infrastructure drive. Yet again, the poor man wants to know what he's getting on a daily basis. Yes, Can you say some of the things that this government are putting in place to ensure that in some cases the poor man is, is his head is above water? So clearly we had to get the big programs off because it's the big programs like the big infrastructure the, the gas to energy project that will give us reliable cheaper electricity the highways the bridges the ports that will create the infrastructure for future growth more hotels being built which will generate more employment nearly three four thousand people more will be employed in the new hotels that would be built. So if you don't do that, you don't plan for the long term, and you don't get those projects off, 
just the feasibility, financing them, getting them started. You can keep the momentum, the economic momentum up. First two years, we spent time on that. We also spent a lot of time on fulfilling the promises that we made to people, so the scholarships. So today, you have about 11,000 people more who didn't have a scholarship, that's ordinary people on the APNU that have a scholarship. You have, you're gonna have 15,000 people who didn't have a job, now have a part-time job. You're gonna have the, the farmers who were told that the rice farmers and their other farmers, that rice is a private venture by APNU, they now got the taxes on, on the machinery and equipment removed. They got the taxes uh, on pesticides, fertilizer, the old DNI charges back, where that had been increased by, in some cases, 500%. Now, clearly the price of fertilizer has increased globally, but this is what they see a government that is benefiting, um, that is helping. And all the farmers now, just imagine a flood on the Apno. You think anybody will get any compensation? They would not have gotten it. They got it because of the nature of the government. The sugar workers, about 1,200 of them more have been rehired. Every one of them, all 7,000 got another $250,000 because of uh, in, in the severance side. So they have received some benefits. The hinterland communities have gotten two grants now. But almost all the villages have now gotten or on, on the way to getting a tractor and a trailer and additional help. The school children in this country have now, they were getting zero, they got $30,000 for every school child now. The pensioners have seen a 40% increase in their pension since we got into office. So I can go down, the fishermen are going to get some help, help shortly. The joint services have seen their one month tax-free bonus return to them. I can go down the business community today, now don't have to pay on the ordinary citizen the five billion dollars that um, in, in the VAT that was charged on water and electricity. We removed it. Five billion dollars less. The miners not only we re did we remove the, the VAT on, on the machinery and equipment for miners and people in the forestry sector, but we reduced the, the sliding scale tax from 3.5% to 2.5%, which makes a big difference. Over $1.4 billion returned to the miners. And we, we took the tributary tax, that's workers in the hinterland, from 10% down to zero. So they got a benefit there too. Need I go on about all of these things? So people, you're asking about ordinary people, but now we have on the house lots, about 10,000 house lots have been given out to people already. We're now preparing another 40,000 plots of land. We have built several thousands of new houses and people have benefited from those. Those are our mani manifesto promises we're working on. So clearly we need to, to make sure that people, we can't do the major roads, you talk about the big roads. We're now transitioning back to community roads that were neglected. So in the next two, three years, we'd have to do maybe four or 5,000 community roads across the country good solid roads so that when people come out from their houses they can they can see the benefit because for a man who in the morning has to come out on the road in a mud dam he you know building the highway may not have such a big impact personally for on him as a, your, his community road but we had to get started get the program going and we did all of this with the first year and a half going to covid going to COVID. So if you, that is how 
we've done our business community through now the local content policy are getting more work hundreds of millions of dollars look at the housing boom just recently we decided that people at the lower end to help them build they will get the free steel for their foundation and some cement all of these are to help people at the lower lower end dr jadio in a past ppp administration and when you were president with scarce resources there were times when contractors not being looked over properly did shabby work how does this ppp administration deal with what is basically an onslaught is is, is work while west roads all over the place sure. lots of new contractors what kind of oversight the largest budget by the way this year what kind of oversight is there accountability um transparency as it relates to these works and the fact that taxpayers are getting their money's worth see this it's a real problem because so much work is being awarded now that many of the contractors are overloaded we have a limitation of good contractors with experience we're trying to incubate a new set of people by giving them removing the restrictions at the lower end so they can start with small contracts like five million dollars and then grow into bigger contracts but that will take time for them to develop the capacity but really the solid contractors with good equipment and strong capability both management and technical they're limited and so often to get the contracts awarded you have to give to people take a chance on some people so with so much work being done invariably some of them the supervision is now very strong and they cut corners and rip you off so this is where we need the local bodies to be vigilant the regions sometimes the region just have a lazy fair attitude to lots of these things or they're very close to some of the contractors so people in the when people post shoddy work being done on a road on their facebook page or send it to a government ministry i don't i'm happy they, many people think oh they're criticizing the government it means our people are vigilant that means they're acting as our eyes on the ground because we can't be everywhere because there's so much work being done now and sometimes they're the, they are the benefit they see it first they draw your attention to it you know how many cases i've sent to public works or the local government to follow up on based on facebook posts about shoddy work so i don't see it as a criticism of the the government i see it as a chance to help us identifying the problems wherever they exist and people should do this because ultimately if the contractor does shoddy work in in your area and the road deteriorates quickly you're going to suffer so that's how i see it and i i believe that people should utilize that more you know send the information to the ministries post it on their web pages take a picture of shoddy work being done on a contract post it on public works page send it to edge hill and indar and nigel darmlal or or the regional chairman and and say i just sent this post on your page that i've just sent this to the regional chairman or so so that if they don't follow up then public pressure will make, ensure that they follow up that's the only way people can help and it would be a potent way of helping but I don't see it as a criticism. Many people see it, oh, the man posted some negative thing here, the road not being done properly. So I don't see it as a, a negative. Dr. Chagliu, um, yourself and the president in 
many outreaches. Um, the president only recently went to Region 9, where he gave $600 million to 600 households to start their homes. And, you know, you guys have been um, putting out there to the citizenry billions of dollars. Um, what is in place to ensure that there is continuum and we don't overspend? What kind of mechanism is in place? Because we're seeing billions of dollars being spent in different places and fair so uh, because people genuinely need help in this country. But are we on the right track? Make economic sense of it for the people of this country. Okay, so clearly it is a valid concern. And we, we have a very aggressive public sector investment program. But you're not going to find frills on this public sector investment program. I've seen countries that produce a small quantity of oil or even have no oil. But the first thing they do is to build a new office for the president and new public buildings around the place. So you don't, will not find that now. If you find a new ministry being built, it's because the land where they are on now is more valuable. And we are trying to use the land for something else or they don't have, they're not all together. We are trying to get them out of buildings that they are renting so we minimize costs. So you're not going to see extravagance here. You're not going to see like APNU increase the dietary by $1.6 billion in the, in, the, in the period that they were in office. I want to see fancy a whole fleet of new vehicles being purchased for everybody. For example, I'm still using the, the same vehicle I was using since 2010. 12 years now, I'm using the same vehicle. It, I could have gotten a new vehicle as soon as we come into office. In fact, there, there was a new vehicle available. I, the, the current vehicle is working fine. So you're not going to see the frills. You're going to see the public sector investment program, a big one, but dedicated towards a number of objectives. First of all, health care improvement. And that's why you see all of these hospitals being built. It's unfortunate that we saw this thing about the IDB report that Kaichor News said they could build a new hospital for the sum that we're spending to replace all, refurbish these hospitals. They clearly don't know what they're talking about. Uh, a hospital in Europe is over a million dollars per bed. Over if you want a, a really world class standard, or in the US, a really world class standard hospital. But we are getting heat now for a report that the IDB did recently, Kaicho News, from Kaicho News and others, because we ordered the report done so we can fix the problem. So we have. Six new hospitals, the contract awarded to be built, I will start soon, 30 million each. Then we have the, the Children Hospital, which will be about 170 million. And then we are now upgrading West Demerara, um, Bartica, um, there are some other hospitals. And this IDB program is to upgrade Linden, New Amsterdam, and Georgetown and build four major diagnostic centers in regions one, seven, eight, and nine. So when you look at what's happening here, new modern infrastructure right across the country to all of our citizens. And then we now have this 
management contract, almost quality control with Mount Sinai, and we're training 2,000 health sector professionals to man these hospitals. So it's a whole plan. But you will see that in the, in the public sector investment program. You will see the highways, you will see the bridges, you will see the power plants, not frills, not fancy things. And then you will see water, housing, the important things to people and so education so it's an aggressive program and it could be a bit inflationary too but that is why we're taking strong mitigating steps to ensure that we limit it we can spend more at this point in time because we have the capacity to spend Another capacity, so we capacity to borrow or to increase the fiscal deficit or to even get more from the revenue side. We could have taken a greater share of the money that will be in the, the, petro, the natural resources fund. But we choose not to, and deliberately so. So we believe that the spending is appropriate you will see an increase in public sector spending. But when we finish building the hospitals, all of these hospitals and rehabilitate, which will happen by 2027, 2025, 27 period, then you'll see suddenly a steep fall off in investments because they're built already. And, and the bridge would be built, and then you'd, and the highways, and then you'd see a steep fall off. So in this period, you're going to see an increase in public sector investment on the capital side, and then over time it would decline. Our savings would be a little less now, but they would climb steeply in the future from the natural resources fund. So then we'll have more resources to tackle the other issues, the soft issues that people face. Uh, so, so that's how we see it. Uh, we are. Having come from that past when we didn't have money to now where we can see our way, we, we develop some, some discipline that sometimes people don't see because the other side never had it. They just explored to increase taxes and spend. They increase taxes and spend, but not on the capital side. Not on the capital side. The capital expenditure in the last five years of APNU, every single year was less than 2040. But it increased the current budget by over 70%. That's splurging, things you can't touch. So we are looking at this carefully. That is why I said we are not going to pander to the extremes. Some people say, spend more, spend out all the money and others say and give out more and others say oh you're spending too much we're trying a long-term balance that is necessary and appropriate and the same thing with the oil and gas sector you know the misinformation there like at the last press conference i went to and the kaicho news asked me about real-time monitoring of expenditure so I said, um, we don't have co-management. We can only do the check the expenditure and then adjust appropriately. So if there is an expenditure that we believe is inflated, we can then deny it and then, then it would mean less, it would be removed from the cost oil and move over to profit oil. <clears throat> But that can only happen when the audits are done. And there are two audits, one by GRA and one that the minister imposes. We can't monitor expenditure in real time because there is no co-management. Kaicho News went back looking for the controversy, said Jack Gale didn't read the agreement. There is a real-time monitoring of the government can do a real-time monitoring of what? of production, not expenditure. You can monitor production in real time. 
how are you going to manage, manage cost in real time? If the people buy, send the man down the road, Exxon now, to buy two ice cream, how would we know, where they, unless you're in there, how would you know that the ice cream is being bought today? That's, that's real time monitoring, real time cost. Unless you're co managing, you're sitting in there every day helping to run the company. It's commonsensical. But that's the story for the whole week. Utter nonsense, rubbish. And they make it into a story. So, this sort of misinformation, coming back to it, whilst I don't think people would be misled by it, we can't take chances. And we have to keep responding all the time. Dr. Jagdeo, just to expound on a point you made there. Um, you have to, after the fact, do an audit of what um, Exxon would have spent and then move it from cost to the profit, the profit. profit side. Yeah. If, is there anything in place in the event, obviously, if that is seen, that means um, Exxon would be directly misleading us. Um, if that is found, is there anything in place that Exxon has to pay fines? Is there any penalties for directly misleading the government? Or no, no, that is but, not considered but, to be misleading? But for it could be, um, no, they're, they just move it from one cost bank to the other, other bank, the cost bank to the profit bank. So, for example, if they procure the standard price for procuring screws or like maybe $10 per screw and we find in the audit that five companies are procuring the screw for $10 and they pay $100 for the screw then clearly we can't accept that expenditure that this is, is not a case where they would have misled you. No, no, they no. might have gone and bought at a higher cost, higher, but lower yeah, cost sold, exists. Right, exactly. And so that's the industry standard and okay. stuff like that. So okay. we need to look at a lot of those. So after the fact, government after will be looking fact. at... So you get back... So you, if they had that there in the cost bank and you leave it as it is, you have less profit... Um, to, to receive so if you can make the adjustment over to the pro, pro, profit bank then you get a, 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 bit, a share of that 50% of that so it means a higher share so that is how it works um, I think no matter how much training you do or information you give to the Kaichou News so they are, are cons consistently misleading. I saw them going after a young man who's been exposing the lies all the time, saying Chronicle carries his whole story, the whole um, uh, right report on the guy, because he takes his time and does proper analysis. Uh, a bag one day, Joel bag one day. So he exposes the lies on a consistent basis. And they're not very happy with that. Vice President, don't you find it strange? Because newspapers around the world are very powerful mediums. Kaicho News and its publishers have been brought to a level, whereas they protest. Normally, the protesting factor is <laughs> buy your medium. Yes, yes, yes. Kaicho News has become so ineffective. They have taken to the streets. And they're the first newspaper in the world to protest. To protest, yeah. Isn't that strange? But I think, I think um, some people are saying they're looking at it politically. So if your ultimate goal is po politics, we've seen a lot of people start off like that. Then you have to mislead to become relevant. And we saw a group going out, signing up of some very shady characters signing up um, people to say, oh, they're not a political party. They just want to renegotiate the contract. But they give you a card immediately. So they've been going around the country 
I think they're closely aligned to the Kaichou news. So I think there might be other motives. Um, but those people are misleading a lot of ordinary people once again. They're, if you start off a political party by, by misrepresentation or misleading, you know, then you, you just can't su survive in the long run. Dr. Jagu? Like, like, like Anug and all of the others used to say, oh, they're the multi-ethnic party and the PVP is not. And I've been making this point publicly over and over, is that we have more members in the PPP, afro Guyanese members, uh, card-bearing members of the party, than they have total votes that they got at the election. But they're multi-ethnic because they have four or five persons of different races. So the total party is 10. So they're a multi-ethnic party. But we get more, we have more Afro-Guyanese members, card bearing members, than they have total votes at the election. But they go on with this fallacy around the place. So I think people have to be a bit more brutal in calling out these things, holding people to account. And, and the moralizing that they do from these high horses, I see some of it. Unbelievable, unbelievable because people chose not to take them on. Dr. Jagger, just to go back a little, we were talking, you were talking about the infrastructure being laid out as it results in the health sector. The West Demerara Hospital was once a new hospital. The Georgetown Public Hospital was once a new hospital, I think built under the PPP. Um, the new yes, setup the new section, now, because yeah. Georgetown Hospital used to be from the other New side. Amsterdam was built on New, Am new Amsterdam. Um, Linden was built what on What has those. always yeah. been found wanting with uh, public sector facilities is the human resource. It's always been found wanting. So I'm, I'm envisioning beautiful new hospitals and then on strained managed staff, how do you deal with this and what was it? You government's see, plan? it's short sightedness again. We recognize this in the past. When the PP got into office in 1992, there were about 150 um, doctors in the public health system. When we left the office in 2015, there were nearly 1,500 doctors. Personally, I went to Cuba came off the plane, Fidel Castro was waiting at the airport for me. We went to his office, we talked about it. He said, I'm gonna set up a special faculty. We're gonna train. I said, I want a thousand doctors trained. We sent a thousand doctor, uh, uh, young people to train in the medical area. They came back. Nearly 400 of them left in the APNU period because they wanted to move them from contract gratuity to the, to the fixed establishment. Many of them didn't want to. 1,000 doctors, young, many are from poor families across the country, hinterland kids, etc. You have nearly 100 and something Amerindian doctors now, up from one in 2001. So we made a dedicated effort to do with this, and we're dealing with it again. We've just come back into office and we also so there were that we trained about four or five hundred engineers and agricultural specialists so right now i said to you there are three components to this uh, world-class health care plan we have management so we are training managers for these facilities the administrators and managers often are not capable they need to run these places in a particular manner. We have to have targets for these, every health institution. When I was president, we had a retreat at Main State, and we came up with an agreement that every, the ministry was going to impose on every health institution 
in the public sector where they had they were going to get a, a sum of money and in exchange for that these were the deliverables we were going to measure waiting time in the in the outpatient area you know number of people treated a whole range of stuff so and then we said we'll put in place the compensation system for the administrator based on results we started it and then it was sabotaged at the at the at the grassroot level too so that was since i was president to try to bring greater accountability this was a long time maybe 2007 or so now we have to bring greater accountability for the administrators many of the administrators disappear things don't function in the hospital you call them they don't even know they don't walk around the place they don't look at they would not go at night and check how many people are in the waiting area what how long they had to wait whether there is enough drugs in the in the hospital only when there is an emergency the theaters some theaters are not functioning because of want of small things we have x-rays and ultrasound parked up for a year in a place without being installed that sort of thing we need to change so it's management that's why we're looking at quality control from mount sinai at an external major hospital that has done this um, that will establish protocols that the doctors have to follow etc so the charts are written up on time so when you if you have any case where people not getting attention somebody a fatality and stuff that you can track what's going on based on the charts All, a lot of those things sometimes we have major gaps in because they're not either there's no protocol or the established protocols are not followed and people are not monitored for them so management is key we're looking at that the second aspect is personnel so clearly the private sector needs to get people for their hospitals too so we have to do training for public and private to some extent and then we have to now reform the system that would allow health sector personnel to come and work easier in the country the medical council sometimes becomes a humbug because they look at some extraneous issues not issues related to experience and qualification they should look at those the issues mainly but like would the person have a work permit all of those issues maybe a bit on the language proficiency in the language they'd have to examine so we need to do some reforms there but we have mapped out how many doctors we will need how many nurses we will need medics technicians and we are using now we're going to utilize our scholarship programs to ensure that we train for the future based on where the level of services we want to deliver four or five years from now ultrasound swallow of our hospitals etc that sort of service as a second aspect third aspect is the the building improvement and facilities so that's happening better equipment more equipped labs nicer facilities friendly places specialized hospitals for children and women and then there is a fourth component support to the private sector through taxation we've removed the corporate tax on private educa education and 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 health care uh, so where anybody who who wants to invest in these areas don't have to pay corporate tax we give them duty free concession and equipment hoping to keep the rates down so even if they move into tertiary care that is specialized care then people Guyanese can access those so we have a, a massive plan mapped out and personnel people a crucial part of that plan dr chadio um being finance minister and president through some very trying times has shown that you have the ability to manage an economy 
and bring it, bring it up. You have the expertise and you've shown that. Um, that would have called for being tight-fisted at the time. So trying to figure out how to get the money and also spending the money wisely. At this time, it is clear to the Guyanese public that yourself and President are the narrators of where Guyana is going and um, how Guyana is moving forward. Are you fixed in your ways and for a, a want of a better term, are you playing cheap on, on, on the infrastructure in this country or have you seen the need to reform your thought process in light of the fact that now you have some funds available to you. But remember, you've been using a trend. You have to figure out ways to get money and then spend it wisely. If we're going to see a Dubai um, or, a, or a little Dubai, as, as a lot are preaching, obviously um, not splurging, but considerations has to be taken in like even choosing the contractors. Mistakes were made with a previous um, uh, Skeldon estate. Mistakes would have been made, right? Have yeah, you but seen on the Skeldon, name? there is again a fallacy that has become almost a fact, that it costs $200 million. Everybody says that. It's not true. It's less than $130 million. It includes the co, the, not just the co generation facility, but the standby um, Wartzilla sets that we're using now. So that's the first fallacy. The second thing is that this plan was reviewed by Booker Teat. We were on the management contract, the best company in the world. We went out to tender. There were two bidders, the Indians and the Chinese. The Chinese won the project. We hired Booker Teat to oversee the contract, to be our eyes, because we're politicians, the board. They were the technical people to review that. They were managing. They failed to deliver on the, the project. We sued them because they were their project managers. They're supposed to ensure quality control. And we lost the case. We lost the case. So it's not um, like that is, you know, mistake, a mistake was made. There was a plan developed with Bocatate. If you check their web, web page now, you would still see that they developed they develop, uh, their plan for the sector. Well, and Bocatate was brought back by APNU, by APNU Desmond Hoyt. Well, the concern, Dr. Jagu, is... So the people think, oh, it's a political decision. We did it because of sugar is, um, you know, PPP base. The idea there, they came up with this plan. They said that we can get cost of production down to 10 cents per, kilo, per, per um, pound if we move more of the production into a larger factory and we get up to 400 and 50,000 um, tons a year. That it means unit costs will come down. That we should shift the production to Burbies where you had class A and B soil, one class one and two soil, versus the Marara soils that were poorer soils. So we, we follow this. I can even remember the plan that they presented to the politicians. These were the technical people in sugar. So we followed a plan. We had the open tendering process. We had a, a contract. It was a text overseen by a group of that nature. Textbook management. Textbook management. Are you open to ideas and spending money differently? Again, the subject is the fact that you might be bent in your ways. I don't know how... Uh, no, the but you're saying I'm tight-fisted. And mm -hmm. I think... Sometimes you do need a sober, tight-fisted voice. In co countries that have windfalls. And you need to constantly question every expenditure. How does this 
advance our country? How does it make the life of our citizens better? How will it um, create the opportunity for our people to grow wealthier, to acquire more, to have a more comfortable life? If the, if the expenditures don't meet those objectives, you're wasting time. So you can spend a lot, you know, on all sorts of things. I've traveled the world, I've seen these fancy buildings go up for government and all sorts of things, you know, like everywhere, like it's just flourishing. I know how many people have offered already to build a new presidential complex for the country. They will finance it and stuff. President Ali said no. No, we don't need that. Could operate out of this building. What's wrong with the building? What's wrong with the building? You know, so you gotta, uh, you know, you gotta be able to to pace yourself. And so I've seen this happen sometimes. You know, people think, oh, a lot of money come in, and we yet people think it's a lot of money. Exxon doing PR. Oh, the government has received one billion dollars so far. This is nearly three years, nearly three years. And so you think it's a lot of money, but when you look at it from the perspective, the hospital that we are building, the children hospital and the for for women and the bridge alone across the Demerara River will take up one year of all the revenue we get from Exxon. But do they have to be built? How are we gonna, these two regions, region three and four, are the most populous regions in the country. If we want to make the other side of the river, like Georgetown, you know, from the mouth of the river, all the way to Wales, like Manhattan or so, you have to have a proper infrastructure. And it starts off with, the four-lane roads to bring the trucks over, the containers over, then people will move their business on the other side. You have to think about that. Um, so, so these are cru crucial things, but sometimes being tight-fisted because even if you wanted to spend too, and, and many people think you can spend as much as you wish, but again, there's something called overheating of the economy. I'm a macroeconomist. That's my training. And so often people don't look at the macroeconomic consequences of fiscal or monetary policies. They think you have these variables that you can do anything with and there would be no consequences at, at the macro level and ultimately it's counterproductive. But every one of those variables that you look at, whether it's interest rate policy, exchange rate policy, yeah, taxation policy, they all are fiscal policy that's spending. You, you basically, every one of them would have a different outcome at the macro level and have consequences for all sorts of things. Look at the US. The U.S. has spent a lot of money, a lot of billions, trillions of dollars in all sorts of things recently. They had this policy of quantitative easing for many years. So it's a loose monetary policy and loose fiscal policy. Massive inflation. Unfortunately, we import some of that inflation, but massive inflation. So now they're increasing interest rates. So interest rates are climbing steeply. All the people who have variable rate mortgages in the US will see a big problem now. They're gonna have high, high interest rate payments. Suddenly third world countries that have to borrow from the financial markets would see their borrowing costs escalate. Every one of these things, because of a loose fiscal policy that is spending too much, it has unintended consequences so you will constantly have to keep a firm eye on the macroeconomy as you 
implement fiscal and other policies. Dr. Jadio, at the end of all of these sessions, um, you know, the President Ali in his one Guyana vision speak about um, supporting and promoting all Guyanese and your administration has taken, um, the Ali administration has taken a stance or a method of reaching the opposition supporters directly. Um, whether it is going into the communities, whether it is outreaches, whether it is infrastructure in the areas. And upon closing these transparent um, interviews that we have, uh, transparency and accountability interviews, I call them, what assurances you have um, for opposition supporters in light of the fact the opposition leader goes across the country and you see people are not very receptive to him he, you know this, they went to Madhya there were 10 people talking to them um, the opposition leader and his um, members of the group that he was with in Madhya just to ensure that operations opposition supporters don't feel left out um, what message would you like to leave with them because the government has leaning, been leaning backward to reach to them. What can they do to work with this government and see personal development? Well, first of all, I'm hoping that the organizations that represent opposition supporters or maybe Afro-Guyanese, um, so that they themselves would encourage people to make full use of the opportunities that are available and that are opening up for all Guyanese. Because from time immemorial, that is what the PPP stood for. Going to communities now not be a new thing. We've gone to Linden many times, um, we've been in the past, etc. But what we have to work against is this pernicious, vile, racist message that as soon as you emerge from the community and you build a road there in the community, they will go and say, look, they've done two roads in, in a PPP area. I remember once um, I think it was Stanley Ming who told the international community that he took, was saying, look at fouls on the East Coast. Now, fouls emerge out of Enmore. Okay, it's a neighboring village. So he said all the, or either he or a few others associated, said they all the lots, or the majority of the lots in Fouls were given to indo -Guyanese. So, this is the PPP racism here, because look, all the land here is allocated. So I had to point out that if we go to Amelia's Ward, because Amelia's Ward is in part of Linden, you will find almost all the lots there given to afro Guyanese, but they would never point that out so it's always this sort of thing it's the lies that follow and people the organizations and people have to be on the ground more often to work from the time president ali or a minister leaves the area you have an apnu leader who goes in and carries out a bunch of lies talking to people again to try to negate any engagement or progress in the community. For them, they want the communities not to benefit so then they can go and campaign. And even when they benefit, they have some other excuse. Oh, they're giving the Indian people money in the sugar workers. Not that you have almost 20% of the sugar workers are black. They wouldn't say that. Or in Linden, you're getting a subsidy for your electricity here. 
So that's the sort of message that they carry all the time. And in a way, it harms the communities because in a way, way many of the young people might feel, oh, we can't get any help from this government. But they need to understand the true nature of the PVP. That's why if you look at the party, I, I was just making the point about black membership and support in the party. It's been growing all over the years. If you look at our track record, all of Guyana has made progress in spite of the difficult and tough years at the beginning. Every community, Linden, I, I keep saying, Block 22, a Miller's Ward, new hospital, new water treatment plant, the roads built, all of that, on the PVP. So, so, and what we, so they do this all the time. This party will support all the people of Ghana. That's what we have always stood for. All the people. We'll keep going to the communities. We have to keep working to negate that negative message because it's harmful. But, and we are going to support. We're not going to discriminate against other, pe other races simply to prove a point to happen. That's not what we're about. We're not about tokenism, you know, a show that we're doing this only for the show of getting a vote. We want to see all of our people develop. All of them get opportunities. But people have to get up and explore these too. If you choose to listen to the bilge and the nonsense of Norton, who can't lead anything, then you may become negative, but then it's your loss. You're not gonna be able to progress. And so, all I can say to people, if you wanna make progress, you'd have a supportive government, regardless of your race, or your religion, or even your political affiliation. That's what the PPP is about, always has been about. Dr. Jagdi, I want to thank you on that note um, for these transparency and accountability discussions as I see them, um, interviews. Uh, thank you once again and thank you for your support um, of the Guyanese people. And I'm hoping we have these opportunities yeah, sure. again to an openness to your government in um, light of accountability and transparency.